Welcome back to Far From Perfect, everyone. So this is the second part of my little chat about maintenance. Last episode was entitled 1500 is better than 1200, but still not enough, where I talked about what is maintenance? Um, how do you figure out your maintenance? Why do we need to live in maintenance? I think I covered that. I should go back and check. Um, and today I wanted to cover like the benefits of living in maintenance. And it's been such a hot topic lately because I've realized like this is the missing thing. This is absolutely the missing thing. I used to think it was just reverse dieting. Like I, I always said, okay, my program teaches you reverse dieting. That is your exit strategy from dieting forever. But there's a step after the reverse and that is living in maintenance. And if you're not sure what that is, go back and watch the last episode. Um, but I mean, I'm, I'm just keep thinking about this. We have all done a program. You have, for the most part, there's not a person that comes to In Your Element or Revive who has not ever done a diet. And when I think about my own history, I had never done like, um, I never did Weight Watchers. I never did Atkins. I never did Keto. I never did South Beach. I just tried to eat less. And for a long time, I tried to eat as little as possible. Like, I honestly thought that was the whole name of the game. You just work out as much as you can and you eat as little as possible. That's how you get the body that you want, right? I mean, now that I know, oh my gosh, I mean, my whole 20s could have been so different. I could have been building the muscle. I could have saved so much time, but we don't know what we don't know. Um, and that's why I teach what I teach. Because I'm my goal is to like make your life easier while still reaching the goals that you have. And if you're watching this on YouTube, yes, I'm drinking a cup of coffee. It is like 6 30 at night. Don't judge. I need it, I needed a little pick-me-up. And I also like just learned how to make coffee. So I'm kind of like a kid with a new toy. This is not a K cup coffee. This is actual coffee coffee. Coffee grounds. So that's why. Um, and so we've all been on a diet, but why, so then why, why do so many people, why are they not where they want to be? What's the issue? If you know how to lose weight, what's the actual issue? And even as I say this, I mean, the issue is twofold. Number one, we don't know how to keep the weight off. All we know is how to diet. Like that is people's comfort zone. That's easier. You know how to restrict, you know how to say no. That's part of it. But then the other part is reaching your um, goals and staying there. It's not just a matter of losing weight. Remember, weight loss and fat loss are two different things. And in order to improve your body composition, it's not about dieting. Improving your body composition is about building more muscle. How do we do that? We do that by strength training and making sure we're eating enough because it's not just about the workouts. Your training and your nutrition go hand in hand. So they don't operate in silos. Fat loss mostly boils down to calories in versus calories out. How much are you eating? But building muscle is about eating enough while you are training in a way that is going to force your muscles to adapt and grow. Where can we practice this? In maintenance. Where are you going to get your body ready for fat loss in maintenance? I'm, I'm not saying that everyone here has to do an actual muscle building phase to where you go into like a 10, 15, 20% surplus and you intentionally gain weight. Most people aren't going to do that. Like, I just know you won't. It's, I did it unknowingly. It was part of my first reverse diet. And then I accidentally have done it in maintenance just because um, tracking errors and just not, not tracking at all. So eating more than my maintenance calories and because of the way that I train, I do train with intent and intensity. I do train in a way that will facilitate muscle adaptation, muscle growth. I was able to build muscle. But I want you to know, you don't have to go into that big, it's not even a big surplus. You don't have to go into that surplus in order to build muscle. You can do it in maintenance. And this is a, for lack of a better word, this is a safe place to do it. 
Now, if you do it with a surplus, you're going to build it faster. You're going to build it more efficiently. But since I can't get people to eat in maintenance, getting you to eat in a surplus is like a huge ask. So let's ease into things. Let's start with that maintenance. Now, you know why we're doing this. You know what it is. How can I make you want to do this? Because I know you're kind of on board. You're kind of on board, but a lot of people think I'm different. My maintenance calories aren't that high. I still don't know if I can do this. I feel safer at that 1,500, 1,600 calorie mark. I want to talk about all of the benefits of living in maintenance because there's a ton. There are a ton of benefits. Number one, I already covered it and I might need to write some of these down so I don't repeat myself. You are actually able to improve your body composition in maintenance. So body comp is possible because you have what I like to call the natural resources, proteins, carbohydrates, and fats to actually build what it is that you want to build. You cannot build a house if you do not have, you know, bricks, wood, Whatever goes into building a house, you can't build that without the materials. You need the materials to build the muscle. Proteins, carbs, and fats are what you need. You have them now when you are living in maintenance. Number two, more energy. In fact, one woman just told me today, she just finished up in your element, Miss Marie. I'm going to tell you the direct quote that she shared with me. And Marie is one of those people who you would not um, look at her and say she needs to lose weight. She's very healthy. In fact, one of the things that she took from our program was learning how to incorporate some of the foods that she had labeled as not healthy because they were like a beef jerky. Well, that's processed. A protein bar. Well, that's processed, right? There are room for those things. And those convenience foods make our life easier. She said, um, you know what the best part of your program was for me? Increasing my food intake and not gaining weight, but finding the energy I needed to start the gym again. I love you for that. That's what it's about. So, I mean, you know, if you are a middle-aged woman listening to this, even if you're a man listening to this, energy comes from food. Calories are energy. And us trying to do it all, like I know what you have going on in your life. I am you. You are my clients. I know what you have going on in your life. I know your commitments. If you have all that going on and you're trying to get your workouts in and you're trying to, you're using your brain all day at work. Do you know how much energy that takes? If you are not eating enough, you don't have enough energy for life. So of course, when you sit down on the couch at night, you just like melt into the couch. Of course, you don't have energy to work out after work. Of course, you don't have energy to cook a meal after work. Of course, you don't have energy to get up in the morning. Of course. So living in maintenance is going to give you more energy. And you know, a long time ago, I asked my audience, I said, what would you rather have? Would you rather have more money or more energy? And of course, inflation and all that. So now it's probably not the best time to ask that question. <laughs> but pretend that groceries weren't so expensive right now. <laughs> pretend that it's like 2019. Things have not hit the fan yet. Would you rather have more money or more energy? Right? A lot of y'all need more energy more than you need more money. So how do we get that more energy? By taking care of ourselves, making sure that we are eating enough. So that's the second major benefit of living in maintenance. Number three, more flexibility. And this is what kills me um, because yes, that 1500 calorie mark, it's not terrible, but you, you still can't fit a lot in. Like flexible dieting, if it fits your macros, in those lower calorie ranges doesn't really afford you as much flexibility as you think. You're still having to put a lot of brain power into what it is you eat. And if you're tracking, you're still having to put a lot of effort into hitting those lower numbers. I know what kind of like mental energy that takes. And you have to watch everything. You have to be really mindful. And this is also why if you think you're eating 12 to 1500 calories, but you're gaining weight, 
that's why you might not be because it's hard to hit these numbers. It's hard to hit the lower echelon of those numbers. Like less than 150 grams of carbs, I think is really challenging. Less than 60 grams of fat, really, really challenging. But when you have more macros to play with, more calories to play with, you don't have to be so strict. You don't have to be so rigid. And I know that's like familiar territory for you, but where the flexibility comes in is uh, when you go out to lunch for work, right? That's really hard for a lot of my clients when they're in fat loss and they have these jobs where they have to take clients out to lunch. And you know, if you have to do that a couple times a week, whew, that's hard on the old fat loss macros. But in maintenance, you have a little bit more wiggle room. Um, spontaneous ice cream with your with your family. Vacations aren't so stressful. And I realize not everyone is as neurotic as I was, but like trips and everything would really freak me out because that loss of control of the food um, would, would make me really anxious. Like, I, I don't want to go to that. I'm not going to be able to control everything. It's going to be really hard for me to monitor what I eat. And now that's just, I mean, I'd be lying if I said it weren't a thing. Like if I have multiple trips in a row and they're longer trips, yeah, of course I get a little bit antsy. I mean, I'm I'm in the process just like you are, but it's so much better than it was. When I came back from Spain, you guys heard me talking about that. Like I never thought it was possible for me to take a week off of exercising take a week away from like, not really, it's not that I didn't care what I ate. I, I know how to eat now and everything will be fine. So that flexibility and that freedom that it affords you, you just don't have to micromanage everything so much. Life becomes less stressful. Now, but part of this is understanding, like you, 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 you have to learn how to feed yourself in this maintenance range because like going back to last week's episode, two weeks ago, the previous episode, it's like, okay, we know what deficit looks like. We can hit those macros even if we're on vacation. But if we don't, if we aren't in that deficit, if we are living in maintenance or we're not tracking or we're not on a diet, we slingshot the other direction. So it's like if there's no rules and there's still rules, like there are still guidelines you want to follow. So ask anyone who's kind of like made it to the other side, let's say you're still following the, the basic principles at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. You make sure that you have protein. You are trying to get as many vegetables as you can while you're out. You are limiting the sweets and the alcohol. You still have guidelines. They just aren't quite as rigid. That, and, and that's really the magic. That is, that is where the learning is. So I, I can't remember if I mentioned in the last episode or not. It's like this freedom comes with a lot of responsibility. And, you know, we don't have a goal out in front of us. It's like keeping us in line. There's no one saying, hey, these are your limits. You have to draw the line in the sand. And that is why it's so important to learn how to do this. Because here's here's what will not stop. Holidays, weekends, birthdays, work, life, <laughs> right? So it's like maintenance allows us to practice the habits with a little more wiggle room. But until we master weekends, Travel, vacation, busy times at work, birthdays, holidays, life, right? We just let life always take over and it's hard. It's hard because I know for a lot of people when things get stressful, the nutrition is an easy thing to let go. But let's take it back to my first question. Would you rather have more time or more energy? When life is stressful, you need energy. So it's like more important than ever to make sure you are nourishing your body, giving it what it needs to thrive. I mean, when you think about it, like maintenance is a wonderful place to be. 
you just can't always be trying to lose weight because that's also a beat down. That is another form of stress. Actively trying to lose weight, it is hard. So what if you took that stressor off of your system? To me, it's another way of saying, right now, I'm enough. I'm not trying to make myself smaller. I'm not trying to change my appearance. I'm trying to focus on eating enough. And it's this also it's also this time to practice some acceptance, to um detach yourself from your worth always being tied up to your appearance. I mean, that's hard for a lot of us. I mean, the other day I was talking about where I spend my money. And you know, you can tell what's important to you by where you spend your money. Um, it's very clear to me that. Um, the way that I look is important to me, right? My bank account would also tell you that. And sometimes I struggle with that, you know, so then there's like this little self-judgment thing, but um, it maintenance gives you an opportunity to like detach yourself and accept what's in the mirror if it's not your leanest. Like it is okay not to be your leanest. And for most of us, Nobody else is noticing. Literally, no one else is noticing. I honestly think you could gain 10 pounds. I could gain 10 pounds and no one would know. Nobody would know. Remember that old like um, reel? How will they know? They won't know. You don't wear your weight on your sleeve or on your t-shirt. Just like you don't wear the size of your pants. Um, and that was going to lead me to another point of, oh gosh, what was my next point? So that acceptance, oh yes, 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 yes. One of the lessons that we teach in, um, in your elements and reinforce in my monthly community is the cost of getting lean. So there is a, there is a slight chance. There's a chance in maintenance, you won't be your leanest. I will say though, the longer you do this, the easier it is to maintain a certain level of leanness with relative ease, just speaking from experience, building that muscle. But, um, you know, some people are able to get pretty lean. It takes a lot of sacrifice. You might realize that the freedom and flexibility and all the benefits that I've already mentioned that you receive in maintenance you might find that those benefits outweigh being super lean. Now, this has happened to a lot of people. Keep in mind, not everyone has been super lean. Not everyone has the ability to be super lean. And so th that statement may not apply to everyone. But those of you who you have been super lean and you know what it takes, you can get addicted to that. Getting a taste of what it feels like to have more freedom and less worth tied up in that level of leanness might break you free from that, for lack of a better word, addiction. Having ease with travel, less anxiety around food, less anxiety around social functions. It might be the thing. Because here's the deal with the cost of getting lean. Um, you might see someone on Instagram, maybe even in real life, and think, oh my gosh, they their their body is, you know, my goals, hashtag goals. But we don't always know what people are doing. And if you've been super lean, if you've competed, like you know what it takes to get really lean. And there are different levels of leanness. Right? There's like stage lean for competitors. There's photo shoot lean. There is lifestyle lean. But each level of leanness comes with a price. And there is a cost of getting lean. The leaner you are, the more sacrifices you're going to have to make. Like if, if someone is getting ready for a show, they can't really go out to eat. When they go to someone's birthday party, party they're eating before or they're taking their own food with them. 
And the leaner you want to be, the more rigid you have to be. Less alcohol, less social functions, more strict workouts, more cardio. So you might find a level of leanness on this spectrum that actually allows you to live a life of less stress and anxiety that is more valuable to you than being so lean. And I mean, this is probably a totally different conversation of, you know, is it worth it? And it really probably only applies to people who have gotten pretty lean and know what it takes to get there. But the level of sacrifice is real. And sometimes you just have to let that go. Like, is the juice worth the squeeze? Is it worth it? Sometimes it is. Maybe for your wedding, it is. Maybe for, I mean, if you're competing, okay, yeah, it is. Um, photo shoot, wedding, family vacation, I don't know. Family reunion, I don't know. Divorce pod, I don't know. But, you know, these are all things that you get to decide for yourself. I am not here to dictate your priorities and your values. But um, I know for me personally, I, I don't know if I could ever get as lean as like I have been in the past. I just don't know if that's possible for me. But I also know that I run relatively. I, I'm, I'm very happy with where I'm at. Very happy. So the fact that I can maintain this really easily, it's not worth it for me to like slash calories, add cardio, not be able to go get frozen yogurt on Fridays after school with my son on a whim. Like that's just not worth it for me but I've been there, done that. So if you want to be there, do that, you might have to go through a time where you do sacrifice more. I don't want to take that away from anyone. Like, um, I remember a few years ago, one of my friends asked me if she should compete and knowing her personality, I kind of steered her against it, but I don't want to shoot anyone's dreams down. You know, if that's something that you want to do, if that's one of your bucket list items, I mean, by all means, go for it. It is nice having a goal like that. And it is cool seeing what your body can do. I mean, it's no different than running a marathon, um, doing an Ironman triathlon. It's an extreme sport. And I do want you to reach your fullest potential. I just don't want you to get, I don't, I don't know if it's the right word, but it seems fitting to me, like addicted to that physique, because that is what gets people in to trouble. And without veering too far off topic, um, I work with a lot of people who have competed in the past. And because of when they did it, like they're my age, they did it while I was doing it. And it's a lot different now. Their flexible dieting really wasn't a thing. And there were a lot of meal plans and it was chicken breast and rice or sweet potatoes and asparagus and egg whites for breakfast and spinach. Um, really low calorie diets, set diet plans that were like 1200 calories and they think that's how you do things. And it's hard getting them to shift gears and understand that you can look just as good without doing all of that. Remember, that's the whole reason I started my coaching. I was like, there's got to be a way to look good without going through all this rigmarole. I mean, we're not all walking around stage lean, but there's no need to be that way. Because also you guys, like you're only stage lean for like a day. Why do you think people always get pictures taken afterwards? Because they know like, this is like one moment in time. This is one moment in time. I have to get all I can out of it as well. You should like, I'm not making fun of that. It's one of the best things I ever did because it taught me so much about nutrition, about training. But I don't want you thinking that that's the only way to get into shape. Like I will never forget. This was a couple years ago and I was uh, going to get a pedicure and I walked in and I ran into someone Um and I knew her from a long time back. She was like a former yoga student and she had just had a baby, like literally just had a baby. Her baby was in a baby carrier. Her mom was with her. She had a C-section and her mom had to carry the baby because she didn't, she couldn't carry the baby. She didn't have, she hadn't met the weight limit yet. She couldn't carry whatever amount of pounds. And with the baby carrier, it exceeded that pounds. And she's like, yeah, I'm thinking about getting ready for a fitness competition. Just like shed the baby weight. I'm like, girl, your baby is four weeks old. <laughs> like, let's not think about that right now. But that's what she knew. And I see that. And it doesn't have to be that way. So anyway, 
the whole point of that was to say, you might realize that the cost of being so lean isn't worth what it takes. It's you feel more value in having all of that extra freedom and less anxiety, because let's be honest, I know I, I can't be the only one who had, I don't have it anymore, but who had that anxiety around food, like not having control over it, being away from home, being out of your workout schedule. And that's why, you know, not everyone talks about this. There is a side of fitness where this, this group of people isn't being addressed. It's a little bit of orthorexia. Um, it's not, it's not totally disordered, but it's also not totally functional, if that makes sense. But we can talk about this. And like, I, my whole point with everything that I do is it doesn't have to be like that. You can reach your goals with more ease and more flow and maintenance is the way to do it. And again, we got to take it back to um, delayed gratification. People struggle in maintenance because these little things pop up like the vacation. I'm going to have to put a bathing suit on, pictures, all these things. And you, you want to rush back into fat loss. But that doesn't give you enough time to live in maintenance and reap all of the benefits and practice the habits. It's the daily habits that we're after. We want this stuff to be who we are so that we don't have to give it so much mental energy. And that's another one of the benefits. I, I briefly alluded to it. You know, you have a lot going on. And if you are running a company, if you are teaching a classroom, if you are operating, if you are caring for patients, if you are doing people's taxes, you know, all of you care for people in some capacity and you're using your brain all day how much mental space is taken up by your diet and your exercise? What else, what could you achieve if you weren't constantly thinking about what you can't have or worried about what's going to be served at the lunch or stressed out about the workout? Like that, that level of freedom is, I mean, that is priceless and it is worth it. But what we have to do then is put off what we want most for what we want right now, because you'll get that message that says, got to lose five pounds, which no one will notice, by the way, right? You'd be better off getting a spray tan, seriously, but I got to lose five pounds right now. What if you just waited? You have to like sit through that discomfort and the discomfort is not from your body necessarily changing. It's from wanting to go back to what is familiar. And this is why change is so hard. And this is why people don't change because you have to change what it is that you do. And this is why, you know, people come to coaching during fat loss, but I think you need coaching the most during maintenance. How do you keep yourself accountable? Some people can do it. I think it's rare. I think it's rare. The person that can do it. Um, what other things on that delaying the gratification? And so I had a group coaching call in my monthly coaching community today, and we have these monthly reverse diet slash maintenance calls. And my good friend Anita was on the call and she was, she was worried that, um, she, she has not done a fat loss phase in a couple of years. And she's heard me say, you know, it's going to take a couple rounds of fat loss and living and maintenance in order for you to like get where you want to go. You're not going to achieve your dream body um, in one round of fat loss. And she goes, since I'm not doing fat loss, if I've been in maintenance for so long, am I holding myself back? And absolutely not. I said, Anita, what you're doing is actually taking a more direct route to where you want to go. So think of it. We had this great analogy because she was a flight attendant back in the day. And, you know, think about if you were taking a flight from California to New York, well, you can fly from California and stop in Dallas and then stop in Raleigh, North Carolina, and then stop in New York city. I'm sure that's not an actual route, but like you could have those stops or you could get there direct. And I feel like, you know, 
having these fat loss phases, it's one stop. It's a layover. It's a layover. So I said, Anita, you're actually taking a more efficient route because she's taking the time to live in maintenance, like at least two years, she's able to build the muscle. So if she decides that she wants to have a fat loss phase down the road, like I, I'm going to be so excited to see like what she can reveal, what she's built in this time, but she's not missing out on anything by not doing a fat loss phase is my point. What she's doing is more efficiently spending time building muscle. So when I talk about nutrition periodization, um, what what's the optional part of the nutrition periodization is adding in that fat loss phase. You can stay in maintenance indefinitely. And to me, that's where eventually we all want to get. We want to get to this place where we say, I'm good. I'm good. Like, can you imagine? And then not like having the mental chatter always of the body, the food. It's completely normal if you're not there. Like, this is like, you know, senior level stuff. And the only reason I'm able to like talk about it now is because of the work that I've done, the time that I've spent doing it, the observation that I've made with not only clients, but myself. And so you see the evolution. It's really cool. I don't know if I have mentioned it before. Let me tell you about a regular like client experience and also personal experience. Okay. Macros. You learn about macros. You find even in fat loss, you find this flexibility because you didn't realize you could fit rice, you could fit bread, whatever. So macros kind of change your life in a way. You learn about this flexible dieting. You think it's so cool. Then I ask you to reverse diet because you've had your fat loss phase and there's a little bit of, not sure I want to do this reverse diet thing. I'm adding calories. First reverse diet. You start to lose weight in the beginning of that reverse diet. So you start buying in. You're like, okay, cool. This reverse diet is awesome. You keep adding more and more and more calories. You get up to that 200 grams of carbs mark and you're like, am I done yet? And there's a little bit of resistance. And I say, no, keep going. And you keep going and the scale is starting to tick up a little bit. You're starting to feel fluffy in your words, but you trust me, hopefully, and you stick with it. And then you live in maintenance for six months and you, that first round of maintenance, as soon as like that six month hit, six month hits, you message me like, Kylie, I need fat loss macros right now. It's been six months since my fat loss phase. I've been living in maintenance for six months. I'm like, okay, here's your fat loss macros. And you go and you do it. And your fat loss phase is okay. It's okay. Or maybe it's not productive. Because maybe you needed more time living in maintenance. But like, we're so excited to get about back to fat loss that we'll even start it in Thanksgiving time, in the holiday time because we just want to go back into fat loss. So the second reverse diet, you know the drill. Okay, I'm adding, I'm adding. It goes a little bit quicker. There's a little bit less resistance. You live in maintenance. And maybe this time you stay a little bit longer because your last fat loss phase started in December and you realize, you know what? That wasn't really, that didn't really work for my lifestyle. So then you stay in maintenance a little bit longer. And then you have a more productive fat loss phase. And you're like, oh my gosh, I stayed in maintenance for eight months this time. And I actually was able to lose 10 pounds in my fat loss phase. And then the third time, easy breezy, you know the drill. And the thing about this is each time you do this, it is easier to maintain that level of leanness. So my first reverse diet is when um, I probably, looking back at the numbers, you guys, I didn't really gain any weight. It was just, I... I hate that I'm even going to say these words because I don't like using them, but like I was softer, fine, whatever. But now that I've been able to build more muscle and have that foundation, it's it's just easier to maintain a level of leanness, even with more calories. So if I could just offer you any advice, just stick with it. Keep doing it. Okay. So that's really the thing. I mean, the biggest thing with maintenance is you just don't have all the pressure. You don't have the pressure you have in fat loss. It's even with me, um, anytime we have this expectation of an outcome, we get wiggy. I mentioned last episode, anytime I start fat loss, I get weird because when I start and I don't see the changes, I'm like, oh crap. And it's this pressure. 
Same thing with this. I honestly pretty much love social media. I love posting reels. I love creating content. I love sharing the things. But the minute it is with the outcome of selling spots for In Your Element, I get wiggy. I'm like, oh, this isn't converting. Ugh, no one's liking this. Ugh, I don't know what to say. Whereas if I weren't expecting people to buy my program and sign up for it, I wouldn't have that feeling. But it's because I have this attachment, this outcome attached to what I'm doing. When I'm done selling the round, I'm free as a bird again. Ideas come like crazy. It's just when we put pressure on ourselves to have a certain outcome. So just like my coaching, like I'm literally telling myself this right now. Do not focus on the outcome. Focus on the daily behaviors because you know the process works, right? You know the process works. Don't doubt it. Keep doing the steps. You guys can see if you're watching on YouTube. I've had this quote up since I did my gallery wall. It says, trust the process. I thought I was going to change it monthly, but I need this reminder so much. I cannot change it. <laughs> cannot change it. So you don't have to worry about the outcome because you've got the process. If you've got the process, time, that's all. You have all the time that you need. So just trust that it's going to work out because it is. The more we worry about it, the worse we make it. And I'm saying all this from personal experience. You guys know anything I say to you is either something that I have learned personally myself or I am currently working on. So I just want you to know I'm in it with you. And maybe it's not in regards to um, food or training anymore. But our food stuff is a reflection of our life. And like all of these lessons that we learned with training and nutrition, they apply to all the other areas in our lives. I was on a coaching call today as a participant and um, it's for coaches. And the coach was saying, it was Karen, Karen Norton, who's been on my podcast. She's great at behavior change. Like I love her so much. And she was saying, like, what things are you having a hard time following through with as a coach? She's like, you just, you have to look at it like you do with your clients. How are you going to hold yourself accountable? And I'm looking at my notes to see with, um, like you have to figure out what are my non-negotiables as a coach? What are my non-negotiables as a business owner? One thing I've been, that I failed miserably at this year, guys, all I wanted to do, all I want to do is start my day with not work in the very beginning. But let me, let me just give you a little background. Let me give you a little background. And remember, next week I'm giving you a life update, which isn't as dramatic as it sounds, but I just, I want to be totally real with you guys. Um, I wanted to start this year doing less and not starting the day with work. Ugh. Well, I failed. And one of the reasons that I feel like I can't not start my day with work is because we moved our group off of Facebook. And in our new community, I don't have the ability to schedule a morning post. Well, my group, my community is used to seeing a post from me in the morning and I've got people on the East Coast, right? So when I'm up at six, it's already eight o'clock for them. And so I'm like, oh, I gotta get something up. Is this all self-imposed? Of course it is. <laughs> Please tell me I'm not the only one that creates her own problems, okay? But anyway, so then I feel this obligation. So I got to make that morning post. And guess what? I make the post and then I see the other things. And then before I know it, it's eight o'clock and I have started my day with two hours of work and not focused on me. And anyone who owns their own business, you know, you have to, you have to do a lot of work on yourself. And I do, like I spend my time with my gym. I do the therapy. I got coaching. I got coaching coming out of my ears. I got a coach for everything because <laughs> I believe in coaching. I want you to know that I believe in coaching. Um, but yeah, so, but so then, so that comes back to the, Kylie, how are you going to hold yourself accountable? How will you hold yourself accountable to not starting your day with work? Well, okay. I can get up 30 minutes earlier so that I can still have that morning post that can no longer be scheduled and have some time for myself to not like 
rush into the day with two hours of work. And what sucks, what, what the hard part for me is too, like, I love what I do. Like, it doesn't feel like work, but it's also not me developing myself as a person. So it's just interesting. How are you going to hold yourself accountable? My whole point of sharing the story with you is you master the lessons in one area of your life and then you let it spill over. There's a huge ripple effect with nutrition and training. The training will build your confidence, not because of the way that it changes the way that you look, but because you see hard work pays off and you realize there is no shortcut. There is no shortcut to building muscle. You cannot build muscle, muscle faster. There, there, there's no hack. Nutrition, it's, I mean, it's a lot of discipline. Even if you're not in fat loss, right? Because freedom comes with discipline. And discipline is freedom. So if you can master that with your nutrition and your training, it's then going to spill over into your career, your business, your marriage, your relationships with other people. So health is not just about what we eat and how we move our bodies. It's about all of the other aspects of our life. And that is why any time spent working on improving the way that you eat and making you feel good in your body, making you stronger, that time is well spent because it's not just about the way that you look. And once you realize that, I mean, you know, that opens up a whole other realm of possibility. Why do you think so many like nutrition coaches, like there, there's also, there's a path for nutrition coaches too. They start out doing one thing and then they master that and then they coach other coaches and then they move into some other type of coaching and all of this stuff. Um, it's because it just, it, I think it all starts with nutrition and training. It is, you can build yourself the strongest foundation here. It's not built on dieting to bring it all home and to wrap it all up with a nice pretty bow. It's all about that maintenance. So lots of benefits, you guys. I just, you know, I'm here. I'm just trying to get y'all to live in maintenance. That's all I want. I think it's the wave of the future. Watch me, watch, mark my words. It's the thing. It is going to be the next thing. And I want to be the person that says, I'm the one who cracked the code. And I want you to crack the code along with me. It will set you free. All right, next week, life update. Um, real quick, In Your Element, the next round of In Your Element is going to start on April 8th. I wanted to do it on the first, but that Sunday is Easter. The Sunday before the first is Easter. And we do our live Q&A call and can't do that. We'll be eating chocolate eggs because he has risen. <laughs> <laughs> so the eighth, I'll be sharing lots of details about that. I think if you're here, you already know about it, but I forget what people don't know. Um, reach out to me on Instagram if I can help you with anything. You guys have an awesome day and I'll talk to you next week.